Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for holding this hearing on such a crucial and urgent issue. We have a serious problem on our hands. We've got a nursing shortage, a nursing workforce that's growing older, and a general population growing heavier with the obesity epidemic. This is a recipe for disaster, and we must take action now. Lifting and repositioning are the leading cause of back, neck, and shoulder injuries in the healthcare industry. Nurses' back injuries cost about $16 billion in worker compensation benefits each year and another $10 billion in medical treatment and lost productivity. In 2007, nursing aides experienced musculoskeletal injuries at a rate of more than seven times the national average for all occupations at a much higher rate than freight handlers and other jobs that require lots of heavy lifting. The problem is that right now there's a disconnect between this data and bedside practices. OSHA nursing home guidelines recommend that, quote, manual lifting of residents be minimized in all cases and eliminated when feasible, unquote and the National Institute of Occupational and Safety Health, NIOSH, sets the safe maximum lifting limit at 35 pounds. These recommendations are great, but they don't mean much if healthcare workers don't have the equipment they need to avoid unsafe lifting. Healthcare workers are the people we trust to care for our loved ones, to monitor our health, to provide us with the best treatment possible, that's what they're trained to do. That's what their expertise is, and that's why it is simply you know, unacceptable that nurses and other healthcare workers are putting their own well-being on the line in order to care for their patients. Employers have a fundamental obligation to provide a safe uh, work environment for all workers, and our healthcare workers are no exception. Not only are these injuries costly and inhumane, manually lifting patients isn't good for patients. When Minnesota passed historic safe patient handling legislation in 2009, it had the support of groups like the Minnesota Council on Disability. That's because mechanical lifts reduce the risk of patient injury too. This equipment requires an upfront investment, but research shows that it pays off in two to three years. The good no news is that we know what, we, uh, what to do to make things better. Because of the pioneering work in Minnesota and stories like Betty Shogren's, who will be testifying later, I am proud to have introduced Senate Bill 1788, the Nurse and Health Care Worker Protection Act. Under my bill, OSHA would issue a standard on safe patient handling and injury prevention, including the use of lift equipment. All healthcare facilities would also be required to implement safe patient handling plans and train workers to use the necessary equipment. So the most important take home message from today's hearing is that we know how to make things better. I wanna thank the witnesses for joining us today. And I encourage my colleagues to consider co-sponsoring S1788 and the Nurse and Health Care Worker Protection Act. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, distinguished chairwoman, and um, thank you for the lead in, my distinguished colleague from Georgia. Uh, I don't, this is not a one size fits all. You know, um, when I first started running for the Senate, the SEIU, the Service Employees International Union, had a walk in our shoes day. Uh, and so uh, you could choose to be one of any thing that SEIU members do, and I chose a, a nurse's assistant because at a nursing home because my mom had gotten such great care. And um, uh, I worked with the guy Ulysses Bridges who had been a nurse's assistant for 25 years or something. And it was a ward with severely, people with severe MS, very disabled. And he had a sling. He had a sling to lift people. And I remember the first patient that he lifted from the bed to a wheelchair. 
and he said, these, these are lifesavers, these, these machines. And I, I, I remember thinking, like, I don't know how he could have done this without this thing. And he said, it just saves so many backs, basically, is what he was saying. Uh, Dr. Hodgson, on our, on our next panel, we'll hear testimony asserting that hospitals and other healthcare facilities don't have the physical infrastructure to implement new standards for patient handling. Uh, can you describe how the VA was able to make the necessary changes to their existing facilities? I'm, I'm not an engineer, but so three parts to that answer. In general, most of our hospitals are built in a way that in fact the weight loads will work for ceiling lifts. Um, second, there are very formal um, you know, structural assessments that are sometimes needed to make sure, um, and sometimes there is structural reinforcement required to make ceiling lifts safe. Third, where those can't be done, there are gantry, there are ways of building a framework inside a room to um, effectively build a steel cage, a frame as it were, on which the ceiling lift track sits. It's not as aesthetically pleasing, it's not consistent with kind of the philosophy of our kind of making hospitals and what we call community living centers, nursing homes, um, look like home, but it works. It is something that can be put up temporarily as a portable thing in homes and residences. So there are solutions for that in almost every place that we've encountered. Where, that is, where it is not possible to do ceiling lifts, there, are, there is portable equipment available to do that. It's generally more expensive, but you know, there are solutions. Thank you. Uh, Captain Collins, NIOSH uh, data show that the initial investment in safe patient lifting equipment and training uh, can be recouped uh, in less than three years. What specific savings are included in that calculation? The worker, workers' comp, uh, savings in overtime, and placement staff, et cetera? That particular savings was direct cost only for workers' compensation. That was the medical and indemnity expenses associated with workers' comp only. That did not include any indirect cost. The cost were recovered so quickly in that study. These were portable lifts that were installed uh, or were available for about every eight patient rooms. So and, and so this doesn't include sick leave or retraining? None of that and went into this calculation. This was direct, uh, the cost uh, on the expense side of the equation was for the purchasing of the lifting equipment and the training and the use of the equipment. And uh, to counter that was the reductions in strictly and workers' compensation, medical, and indemnity expenses. And, and just to assure my, uh, my colleague, my esteemed colleague from Georgia, th this is not a one, I mean, you, each lifting exercise is different, right? Right. There was uh, multiple prescriptions for how patients would be lifted depending on their disability, their weight, and their ability to bear weight. So there were... Uh, one of the challenges in the study was how this was communicated from the nurse management to the nursing aides and orderlies. I think part of the reason there are so many injuries is that there are so many awkward different ways of having to lift so many, and there's almost an infinite number of lifts that you have to do. And so obviously the common sense solution to it is certainly not a one-size-fits-all, is it? No, sir. Well, thank you. Well, uh, from the, we allow two years from the promulgation of a final regulation uh, to, for hospitals to enact. And so it'd be, it'd be two and a half years after enactment that providers would be expected to develop a plan. They wouldn't have to purchase the actual equipment until two years following the implementation of a final regulation. So that's four years after the enactment. Okay. So you've that got a four-year transit, and you also have a grant program, is that right, in HHS to help hospitals in the acquisition? Is yes, that yes. Yeah, oh, yeah, this is federal money comes, and, and uh, yeah. And my last question, and, and it's not really these aren't questions as much as they're kind of observations that portend themselves to be a question. In that one caveat about the patient care being compromised, 
that clearly is going to be, a, to a certain extent, a subjective judgment that's going to have to be made at a, a moment in time. But it looks like the enforceability, other than the no-notice inspection, is through litigation. Is that correct? If somebody complained they had an injury because of the lifting and the decision was made. I think it'd be done through OSHA. Through OSHA. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, and OSHA, uh, can I take it from here? Senator Franklin will take it. Okay, thank you. Uh, under this legislation, OSHA would issue a standard on safe patient handling and injury prevention that requires the use of lift equipment to move patients except in cases which would compromise uh, patient care. Care facilities would implement safe patient handling and injury prevention plans. Workers would receive training on safe patient handling and injury prevention. Workers would be protected from employer retaliation if they refuse to accept assignments which do not meet safety standards and Health and Human Services would administer a $200 million grant uh, program to cover costs of acquiring uh, safe handling and equipment for eligible facilities. Let me ask you, Captain Collins, what reduction in injury rates could we expect if a national lifting standard were implemented uh, as is called for in the bill? What we've seen in the best practices programs where they, they have a comprehensive safe patient handling and uh, movement program, uh, injury reductions have been achieved uh, in excess of 60%. And uh, the Institute of Medicine and the National Research Council, who's examined the literature, has, uh, has come to the conclusion somewhere between 55 and 65 percent injury reduction when you eliminate the, or significantly reduce the manual lifting and replace that with assistive devices. So do you think that a, a standard would yield savings for healthcare facilities? Do you, do you think that a standard would yield savings for health care facilities? The, uh, yes, sir. The, the, the findings that we have is that when the programs are comprehensively implemented, that somewhere between three and five years that there is a, uh, the return on the investment is achieved. So that, and after that, then you're actually, uh, you're, you're making money, so to speak. So the return on investment uh, there would be a return on investment here that's greater than the investment. And, three, three to five years. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Silverstein and uh, uh, Ms. Al Alteris, um, could you s please respond to Mr. Erickson's assertion that we should, that it would take decades uh, to implement uh, this bill. Uh, Minnesota facilities, uh, Ms. Shogren, were uh, able to make changes much more quickly, and I assume Washington has too. Can you, uh, and I want to point out that, that my legislation really r gives four years to enact this. So can you respond to Mr. Erickson, either of you, or any of you? Ms. Shogren too. Uh, three years it, you, in Washington. You did it in the entire state? Yeah. In three years? Yeah. Okay. And uh, was Alteris? Uh, it took our organization three years, and we have three hospitals. We have over 1,000 patient beds. In addition to all of our, we have 60-plus operating rooms, and we were able to install, and in, it's actually under three years. And Ms. Shogren, what was the experience in Minnesota? The law won't be fully implemented until the end of the year, but the law provides about two and a half years to, um, to fully implement the program, and there is a provision for hardship um, for an additional year. It can be extended if the uh, employer is experiencing hardship. Um, now, let's talk about one of the reasons I love nurses that there is that they're patient advocates. And I want to, from the patient's perspective here, the disability community in Minnesota, uh, Ms. Shogren, when this was, um, uh, when this law was passed, I understood they were, they were for it, right? They were advocating for it. 
Well, we talked with just about anyone who would talk with us as we were getting ready to um, work on the bill. And we found that within the disability community, we had some kindred spirits there from a different perspective. They were very concerned, especially in the outpatient care settings, which is why we did the amendment, that even though the, the um, facilities had ramps at the doorways and buttons that you could push to open the doors for you, that once they got beyond the waiting room, they were not equipped to care for them. Um, and they couldn't get on the exam table. So for instance, the MS Society uh, lobbyists testified that only about 20% of women with MS can get a pap smear every year because they simply can't get on the table. Um, and, and that was a very fundamental issue around access to health care that we felt was very compelling. Um, we also know that when we lift patients manually, we're generally hurting them. That's why they're combative. And I didn't go into nursing to hurt people. And the fact that I can use equipment uh, to help move someone versus, you know, brute force to try and do it seemed to me uh, a much more compassionate and humane way to deal with, with the issues of people who needed assistance. Let me ask you about the Minnesota Hospital Association. Did the Minnesota Hospital Association oppose the safe patient handling bill that was enacted in Minnesota? No, they testified they felt it was the right thing to do. Well, I'm proud that Minnesota hospitals uh, understand that worker safety is, is part and parcel of good patient care. And uh, if we can succeed in Minnesota and Washington, if, these can be, if this can be implemented in three years in Washington, I don't know why it would take decades in other states. So um, thank you all for your testimony today, and thank you, Madam Chairman.